my great pleasure to introduce Leonard Logsdale to the show Bespoke Taylor. Uh, Leonard, how are we doing today? Doing just great, thanks, Pete. Couldn't be better. Leonard, so you, well, about, good to speak to you. I'm so happy that you managed to fit me in. I know you've got a crazy schedule over there. Um, you're New York-based at the moment, correct? Uh, no, not at the moment. I'm permanently New York-based. I've been out here for 30 years now. Permanently New York, absolutely. So do you have a... Have you, come back to London at all? Do you, do you find you this I, way? I, I used to go back, you know, once or twice a year, uh, but certainly have not been back since COVID. You know, this, right. is, this is my home. And when I go back to, to London, as much as I really enjoy it, you know, I'm actually get anxious to get back here when, I, when I'm back there. Right. Okay. Interesting. So uh, just before we get into your, your film career, Leonard, which I'm, I'm very keen to tap upon, maybe you can just give us a thumbnail sketch of where you began. Did you begin on Savile Row before you moved to New York? Yeah, well, I started, uh, I've worked on Savile Row, but actually my business was on Sackville Street, just at uh, the end of the end of Savile Row. And uh, I had my business for about 20 years, yeah, 20 years before I moved over here. And, and this year in December, I've had my business for 50 years. So I had uh, th three or four jobs before I started my own business and I kept on getting fired because I was a 21 year old who thought we knew everything about that there was about tailoring. So I kept on getting fired. So that's when I started my business. I figured it's the only way I could earn some money. Interesting. Yeah, I, I did hear about um, you getting fired in a certain few places. I think Morris Sedgwell was one of them to, to begin with. Morris Sedgwell, and I saw, him, I saw him in the pub once, the vine at the end of the street, and he's hopping backwards and forwards. And, and, and he said, can I say something to you? I said, of course you can, Morris. And he says, he says do you know why I fired you? I said, I've got a good idea. And he's, it's because you thought you knew everything. <laughs> Even after all those years, it was still frustrating him. <laughs> so if I ever meet him again, I'm going to tell him. <laughs> um, well, actually, that kind of segues into another question. I mean, the, the podcast that uh, we're, we're talking on, I started with a friend and we, we started about the first 75 episodes were all geared towards James Bond. Um, we were yeah. writing a book at the time. We've since released that book. And... Uh, we we found me and my friend. It was just like these uh, the the seasoned veterans of the tailoring industry that's been around for such a long time, like yourself, have like, are like the gatekeepers to all the great stories because there's just uh, I guess so few of you around. Um, so I'm just curious, did you were you in the kind of same ecosphere as some of the other tailors that were working along Saxville Street along that time, maybe Conduit Street, like say Cyril Castle, Anthony Sinclair, etc. Well, Cyril Castle and Sinclair, they were kind of before my time. That, I, that I, I, was, I was still a young Turk back then when, when they were, were making for uh, uh, Sean Connery. And I don't know that I met either of them. And they, I think they are pretty much retired before I really got myself going. And when I first started, I was in Carnaby Street above all the, all the boutiques back in 19, December 71. And I pretty much stayed that side of the street and I used to go out, because it was such a dump, we used to go, Bursto and I, we used to go out and see all of our clients in their offices and their homes. So we really didn't get that much time to, to, to socialize. And it's only as we got busier and then we moved to Sackville Street and started working there that we were kind of accepted actually, that people didn't want to accept us. Uh, I bumped into a very well-known tainer once in the street that I knew. And he said, I understand you started your own business. And I said, yes, I have. He says, how dare you start your own business? And I said to him, well, do you have a good business? He said, yes. And I said, do your, do your customers have a, you have a good relationship with them? He said, yes. And I said, well, what are you worried about? Yep. You know, that they, were, they were just terrified of their own shadows. Right. So, and I was seen as, I, was, I guess I was aggressive uh -huh. back then. I'm a much more plastic person now. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I guess I didn't really factor that in because there's, like, there's certain streets like Berwick Street, Saxville Street, Conduit Street, obviously Savile Row, where you have like this plethora of tailors, not so much yeah. on some of these streets anymore. And I guess um, as much of a, a community that people kind of try and make it out to be, there's also a big territory war, let's face it, where people are fighting for custom. Um, so I guess you must have found that back then as well. Well, to, to, to a degree, but uh, we really started with only a couple of clients. And, and, and actually, most of, the, most of the businesses you see on Savile Row are, were, were from cutters that then took their book and started themselves. 
and uh, I, I, I had two clients to my name when, uh, when I started and just, just worked hard at it. You know, I started uh, by going out to the city and out uh, to Kensington and Knightsbridge and places like this in Chelsea. Then I got my first sniff of a client in Amsterdam and made my first business trip was to Amsterdam. And the next thing I know, I was going to see if I can work this out. I went to Brussels, Rotterdam, The Hague, Amsterdam, Eindhoven, Luxembourg, Frankfurt, Geneva, and Paris. And I was driving that about six times a year, seeing clients. And then as that built, build up, built up, I kind of had an inkling to come to the United States. And so I had one or two clients and I had two, two so I came out, I had two days in New York and two days in Washington and went, went uh, built it up from there. Wow, fascinating. Uh, that sounds like my girlfriend and I just watched Jerry Maguire the other night. It sounds like a, the, the, the backdrop to that film where you just have one client and go all the way to the top. <laughs> um, well, so when you... Yeah. When, I would say I'm at the top, but I'm still trying. <laughs> but when you moved to America, uh, how quickly or how long did it take you to get into films? Was it, was it The Good Shepherd where you started out as, as getting your big break, would you say? It was The Good Shepherd. In fact, I was sitting in one of these chairs. I've got four of these chairs here. I was sitting one talking to a friend of mine from San Francisco who was visiting me and the phone went and there's a this girl on the phone Michelle and I'd, I'd spoken to Michelle a couple of times and she said Leonard would you be interested in making a suit for Robert De Niro so I said we hang on a minute and I spoke to my friend and I said there's a lady on the phone that wants to know if I should make a suit for Robert De Niro what do you think and he's just sort of looking at me with, with his mouth open so I said yes I'll do it and <laughs> that's how it all began and you starred in that film as well. You were the tailor in that film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like to put it that, um, oh, God, what, what's the guy's name? Um, who was uh, the star? It was Robert Nero and Matt Damon the, uh, was in there as well. Matt Damon. I would say that Matt Damon had a speaking part with me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very Brian Clough of you to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was interesting as well. I was fitting De Niro, and he's kind of looking at me quizzically in the mirror. And he turned around and said, you know, there's a, speak, there's a part in this movie for, a, for an English tailor. Would you like to be in it? And I said, sure, I've never been in a movie. Sounds great. So he said, OK, you'll hear from my office. And then I found out afterwards he was actually the director as well. When I saw him a couple of weeks later, I hadn't heard anything. And he said to me, did you hear anything? And I said, I thought you were just pulling my leg. I, I, I didn't hear anything, but it, it's OK. And he was very annoyed. He said, you should have heard. I got a call that evening to go for an audition the next day. So I said to my wife, what the heck do I have to go to an audition? All I'm going to do is stand there and, and do, do, you know, do a fitting while the actors are talking. Uh -huh. So I went along for the audition and the guy said, did you earn your, learn your lines? And I said, I didn't know I had any. I went uh -huh. through it and I thought that was it. I'd never hear anything. Then I got a call the following day to go for another audition with De Niro. And so I, 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 I had one of those classics. When we finished, we ran through it a few times. He thought about it. He put his hand out and he, and he goes, well, Leonard, thank you for coming by. We'll be in touch. And I thought, well, that's it. But anyway, I did hear and, and did, had the part. It was a lot of fun. It was, oh, it was that's, a lot of fun. That's so sweet. I mean, and then, I mean, fast tracking, you got to work with De Niro again in The Irishman, if, if that's right. So, yeah, before, before that, I, I worked with him on The Intern as well. Ah, yes, yeah. The Intern and then The Irishman. They're, they're the only, they're the three movies that I work with, uh, with him. And how does it work? Is it just coincidence that you kind of wind up with some of the same actors? Is it more a relationship with the costume designers than the actors themselves? Absolutely, the costume designers. Right. And, and, and not only the costume designers, it's their assistants, because the assistants move from movie to movie and often with new costume designers. And the costume designer will, will say, well, where do we go to get suits? Because some of them come from, from London, from over here. Um, Sandy Powell does a lot of work over here. So she had to ask the assistants before she eventually found me. And, um, and uh, some of them come from San Francisco. And there's a, there's a, a woman that I work with is now in London. And she didn't know where to go. So I advised her where to go when she went in London to try and find a team around her. So, yeah, but it's, that's, that's where it comes. It's never the actor. Okay. Uh, it but, might have been, might have been old, 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 olden days, you know, when everyone, the, 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 the movie stars all had their suits made and they all had their personal tailors. But now 
they get freebies from all these places, but, but, but from, from the designer houses, but the designer houses can't make costumes. They can't go to different eras. They can only make what they make. So, uh, so that's why they, they, they need me. Well, I was going to ask as well, because films like The Good Shepherd, um, The Post that you worked on as well, I mean, these all have to be very oh. per period accurate pieces. Yes. Uh, are they harder for you to do in terms of sourcing fabric or, or is this just now kind of in your, in your locker? Well, it's, what happens is I have a really good relationship with the, the costume designers because they come in for the, say, for the first time, and I've met them for the first time, I say to them, I said, look, I work for you, and I understand that. I have an opinion. Do you want me to give an opinion, or do you want me just to be quiet? And I'm quite happy to do what you want. And they goes, no, you, know, you have an opinion. I said, if you disagree with me, you just tell me. I'm okay with that. And so because of that, I'm able to really assist them um, because if, if I show them some fabrics and they say, no, that's terrible, I say, it's okay, I'll put it away. And you're learning and, and bit by bit, you can find them out. But I have a, a ton of fabrics up here. The, the, the hardest part now is when you go into the 40s and 50s or before, when the lightest weight suits we were making back then were 15, 16 ounces. To find a good 15, 16 ounce suit now, it's almost impossible. Uh, can they not be made or manufactured from new? They can, they, they can get them made, but so it's expensive. And often it's a lot, you know, they need to make 120 yards of it or meters. And, and they, they may not only need it for, you know, two or three suits. So it's, it's very difficult. So often now it's a matter of making do with the heaviest fabrics that we have. Right. But the fact about finding the fabrics is not too bad. And, and the, uh, the assistants are, are pretty well clued in to all the different fabric houses the smaller ones in new york city and it turns out there's quite a lot of them right. where you can go and find you know odd lengths here and there leonard i'm always curious that when uh, productions and film houses come to tailors that it can be quite lucrative for some tailors to, to be doing this in terms of like say for example in london i know some tailors that have survived only through the film industry from them giving them work especially through lockdown and pandemic etc but luckily they've said film productions have come to them and they've managed to keep afloat that way uh, when when they come to you are you kind of thinking that's a that's a good that's a bit of good news or are you thinking crikey i'm already flat out how am i going to fit in a whole film production around what i've already got for my personal clients if, if i'm flat out i've, I've turned movies down because the, the, the movie industry is fickle. It comes and it goes. You know, you, I get a lot of telephone calls, you know, we're thinking of making a suit for so, a few suits for so-and-so for such and such a movie. Yeah, can you make it? What's the, what's the price? And I'm expensive. So uh, that generally, you know, pushes them off. They, 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 never, they never phone and say, we've gone somewhere else, but you know, if they call back, but I've turned them down because, because they come and go, my bread and butter, to, for want of a better term, are my regular clients, my one to four to six to suits a year. You upset them and you upset the core of your business. So I only accept a movie when I know that I can do it properly and I won't let the movie house down. So I only accept it if I know that I can do it. Leonard, I reached out to you, uh, I guess it might have been a month or so ago because I'd seen Wolf of Wall Street, I think for the 10th time and knowing how much work you must have done on that or your name attached to it. Uh, maybe you can just tell me how you got involved with the film and, and how, the, the scope of your involvement as well with this. What with, with, uh, with Wolf of Wall Street? Please. Well, yeah. that was, that, that was Sandy Powell and I worked with her before on one or two movies and uh, they called me and she, she actually, well, perhaps I shouldn't say that there was a famous designer that, wanted to use, want, wanted to, to make them, but couldn't make the period pieces. But he actually paid to say that he paid, he paid my bills. He paid the, the, mo the movie house and the movie house paid my bills. And I was going home one evening and there was, uh, there was DiCaprio in a suit that I made and it said a, a suit in, and then this designer's names, uh, a, a clothing. Uh -huh. uh, it, but it was one of mine. But that's what he paid for. They have they have advertising budgets. I'm just a small guy. But to answer your question, it's a, um, I got a call and then I worked very well with Sandy. We, we get on very, very well together. I've been out to, to Los Angeles a number of times with her doing, doing different fittings with different people. And she trusts me completely because I, I, I produce what I say I'm going to produce. 
in the time that I'm, I say that I'm going to do it. Because uh, when you when you mess around with the timing, I give you an example. When I did uh, American Gangster, uh, they moved from 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 Harlem to the Hilton Hotel, which is like two blocks from where I'm sitting right now. And I got a call at 7.30, 8 o'clock one morning from the costume designer. And she goes, Len, where are you? And she cursed like a trooper, this woman. Where are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm at work. She says, well, get your ass up here. We've got a, a suit here that's all creased and it needs to be pressed. And I said, okay. So I walked up there, I found the costume truck and, and I looked at it and I said, and what they, they did, they put all, his, all of his suits onto the truck and they pushed them all together, they clamped them down. And this was like a, a seven, eight ounce tropical and it, it creased it. So I said, okay, I'll press it. So I took it back and I just got back here and she said, is it ready yet? And I said, Jamie, it's, I'm still working on it. <laughs> so I'm walking, walking back and she called me for about the 10th time, where the fuck are you? <laughs> And I said, I'm, I'm about two blocks away. She says, it's costing $10,000 a minute and they're waiting for that suit. Oh my word. So, so I, I, said, I told her, I said, well, I'll run. So I ran and I met her into the lobby of the hotel. And I thought she would just take it from me. But she said, follow me. So we went to the elevator and they, they, we were, what they were filming in, in the penthouse. And somebody had let them, they'd been holding the elevator, let the elevator go. And so I'm looking at my watch and that's, uh, what's that's four minutes. That's $40,000 they've just lost. And then we went to the, uh, went to the top and she took me first of all to Denzel and I'd spent a lot of time with him, put the suit on and he says, how is it Leonard? And I said, it's fine. It goes great. Okay. And off he goes. And then he, she took me into the director, Ridley Scott. And to, so that I could tell her, tell him rather what had happened because she was afraid she was going to get, get billed for the, for the time they were waiting for the, uh, for, for the suit to be ready. Oh, wow. That was going to come out of her budget. Yes. So, no. so I said, no, it was, it was, it got squashed in the, in the truck. It's nothing to do with, with uh, the costume design. <laughs> that's no... Oh, wow. That's such a, well, you never really know what goes on. I mean, and, and I guess, I think, oh. I, I think I'm familiar with the scene where he kind of comes down that circle uh, stairwell and just kind of put, uh, and puts it on. And it's, you know, to the audience, that's just Denzel putting a jacket on. Um, but to production, that's close to 50 grand just going on right there. <laughs> <That's> right, <yeah. laughs> Interesting. Um, so that's Sandy Power. And um, was, were you also working? Uh, sorry, that's Janty Yates, I think, for um, America. Right. 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 Um, Sandy Powell, did you do work with her on Shutter Island? Have I got that right? Shutter Island, uh, The Irishman. Uh -huh. um, uh, there, was, there was another one in uh, Cincinnati that I'm blanking on right now. And uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Right. And with, with the, sorry, Leonard, with The Wolf of Wall Street, uh, the, I think the original tailor was uh, Anthony Gilberto, I believe, for the original character of Jordan Belford and the stories are of him, you know, coming in and doing all his Stratonites, 2000 pounds, $2,000 suits. And you can see them getting measured even in the film. Were you in that? Was there a cutaway scene of you as well? Measuring someone? Yeah, there? I was in that scene. They called me up and they said, would I, would I go, you know, they were looking for a tailor. We need two tailors. Yeah. Do you want to do it? So my son was working with me at the time and I said, well, my son's here, you know, do you want him? So I sent that they asked for a photograph and the pair of us went on. Truthfully, I lose money when I do things like that, but I thought it would be a great experience. So yeah, I was, I was uh, took him onto the set and we were standing talking and then uh, DiCaprio came in and saw me and he walked straight over to me. Then he went, went to got Scorsese and brought, brought him over and introduced them to my son. But you know, if you blinked, you would have missed it. You would have missed it. I got but you it was, it, it, again, it was fun. <laughs> the funny part was, that was set in the in the eighties, I guess. And so the first thing they did when we arrived, they sent us to hairdressing. So my son goes in and they're doing all sorts of things to his hair. And I walked in and the and the, the guy said, Oh, thank you. You've got your hair in, in the ear already. And I said, Well, no, that's just the way it's been forever. <laughs> <laughs> just so happens I was born for this moment. <laughs> so we did you do um were you kind of in charge of doing, I know you did stuff for Jonah Hill and suits for Jonah and Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, were there other tailors doing stuff for extras? I mean, because I mean, it's such a suit based film. Uh, yeah, they, it, it, it's, it's a lot of what they buy. They go, they go to different, to, I, in fact, I went with Sandy to a place in San Francisco, in uh, Los Angeles. It was fascinating to me. It was, it was a clothing warehouse. 
So while, while she was looking for what she wanted, I just wandered around the place and I found myself in the 1930s, 1940s. And then they've got uh, sizes 38, 40, 42, 44 and upwards, uh, plain gray two piece, plain gray three piece, gray stripe two piece, gray, gray and blues and checks and browns and tweeds. And we're just doing in the 38. It was completely full. Uh, I've, I've never seen a place like it. So they get a lot of their suits from there. They pull them, they pull them in. And uh, they only use me for, by and large for the top actors. And then they will use people like Gilberto for, 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 the, for the background scene because that's made in a factory and it's made cheaper and uh, it, it suits their budget better. Okay, interesting. So it's, that's quite a nice uh, inclusion though to have him like the original Taylor with Jordan yeah. Belford in, yeah. in the production he's a good somewhere. Friend of mine. Anthony is a good friend. I mean, he's kind of nowhere online. Uh, it's it's interesting how some tailors might just have a holding page. Some might just have a, an Instagram that's never used. I mean, he's really someone that is not that interested in having any awareness online, do you find? Well, I, I think pretty much it, all of his business is mainly theatre, not so much movies now. And, uh, and so he, he, I don't think he needs, probably thinks he needs it because he's really well known in the theatre business. Right. And there's, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of productions going on and off. Although, you know, he, he probably regretted moving away from his regular clients uh, when COVID hit because yeah. it was, you know, it was the movies that kept, you know, that the, uh, the, the Gucci movie, when that came along, that was a lot of suits at a time when there was not a lot of business. And you did work on the Gucci movie as well, the new one that's coming yes. out. Um, so that's Janty Yates as well. So again, another costume designer that's kind of teaming up. What, I know the film's not been out yet, so I guess there's only so much you can talk about, but maybe just tell me about some of the experience, some of the highlights of working on a film like that. Well, it was, it was very, very hard because, because of COVID, I couldn't go out, out to Italy to do any fittings when the, when the actors moved there. So I had to do a bunch of fittings here and I cut an individual paper pattern and I really look after the fat patterns as I fit. And I went out to LA twice to go and two or three times actually to see Pacino. And I, I worked with him two or three times before. So that was, that was a very comfortable experience. Uh, and it was just backwards and forward. It was more the logistics because it was, it was the, the scenes change every so often. They have, a, they have, right, well, tomorrow we're doing such and such a scene in such and such a hotel. And then all of a sudden something goes wrong. So it switches around and say, Len, we need such and such a suit because we need, we need to get it there tomorrow. I mean, one time uh, I, made a, I made a purple plastic suit for Ben Stiller, for Zoolander 2. <laughs> I, got the, I got the cloth at five o'clock on a Friday I cut, I, I'd worked with him before as well. I cut the suit out. We, we made it over the weekend, finished it on the Monday. Monday night, it was on the plane and it was on the set on the Tuesday morning in Rome. That's rough you know, and roll. There's certain deadlines that you, you, know, you just have to get to. That, that's all. Let it. And, uh, some, go on, sorry. No, no. I was, I was just curious. You've worked with so many great actors, um, you know, so many actors that I've grown up with my childhood as well. Pacino, De Niro, still. Do you do you ever get starstruck if someone ever goes, "Hey, you're going to be tailoring for this guy at all?" Are you kind of beyond that now. No, no. Yeah. There, 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 there are means. There are means for me to provide for my family, and that's it. You know, then you know you see all these people. You see them with their trousers off. I mean, they're they're all. Everybody's exactly the same. And the, I've only asked for one photograph to be taken with me, and that was with Dick Van Dyke for Mary Poppins Returns. And that was, that was with uh, Sandy Powell as well. I went to, went to his house two or three times out in, um, uh, in, in Los Angeles there. And he, I grew up watching him, the Dick Van Dyke show, and Mary Poppins, the first Mary Poppins. And he was such a sweetheart. He was about 88, I guess. He would tap dance, he would sing to us. You know, he was just a natural. And I said to him, do you mind if I have a photograph? You know, I've never asked, I, I'd just like to have one with you. So. I, I, it's the only time. No, oh, that's sweet. What, what about your son? I'm curious. So is he, is, you mentioned he was also on the set with uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Did he get involved um, in, the, in the business at all? Has, how is he He did, but then he, then, he, then, he, then he moved off. Uh -huh. uh, excuse me, sorry. I'm no, no, sorry. that's fine. No, no, no. Uh, 
Okay. Um, he started here. It was actually very interesting. He started here and he actually was very good, but he really didn't like working with me, with me having, you know, power over him. I guess that's a good way of putting it as he was getting older. And he didn't like the structure of coming in every day, working, going back every day. He felt like he, he, it was aging him before he wanted to wait. <laughs> so he goofed off. He went out to Bali, out to Indonesia, and started doing free diving and spear fishing. But then one day he strapped on a, a GoPro and put something on, uh, on the internet. And now he has something like 230 million views. Uh, he's got a production team. He's bought a boat, a captain. He has a full-time dive photographer. And, and he said to me, he started laughing. He says, you know, Dad, I've got a regular job now. <laughs> but I, I just enjoyed it more. Oh, that's nice. Well, that's sweet. Well, I guess he had to make his own course in life. He did. He did. Um, well, Leonard, thanks so much for uh, walking me around some of the filmography. I know there's a, uh, if you go onto IMDb, by the way, there's, it's quite the list, quite the resume you have, sir, with uh, like the great. Yeah, Gatsby. well, we're, we're thinking of, uh, we're, we're, there's so many that are not in there that I've st I haven't bothered. My son was doing that and he went two or three years ago. I've made a lot of mo movies since then, but I, I just haven't updated it. And it's something I plan on doing at some point, but there is quite a lot there. You're right. I mean, you mentioned also how like there'll be certain tailoring fashion houses that will have you do the suits, but they don't want the association. Uh, I've, I've had familiar territory with this with a tailor called Chris Kerr, who spoke about, uh, yeah. who spoke on the podcast. So he won't mind me saying it. He spoke about how he made a suit for Daniel Craig in a commercial. Um, but obviously it's under the Tom Ford umbrella. So his name couldn't be anywhere near. Um, lots of red tape, lots of lawyers, lots of this and that. Um, do you ever find that kind of irks you when you make no. such great suits, but your name's not attached to them? Is that, does that never dig in your craw? No. I, I, I honestly don't care. You know, uh, my, as I said before, my job is to provide for my family. So I have no ego in that whatsoever. That's my job. And I, there was one actor, I guess you could, I guess I could say it's Bruce Willis. I, I, I made a movie for him a long time ago and I can't remember the name of it. And when it was finished, he wanted some private stuff made. Uh, he, made he had a red suit for an advertising campaign and a couple of cashmere pea, pea coats for him and one of his uh, assistants. So I delivered them at the, at the set and then I gave him a, a, a bill, an invoice. And he said, what's this? And I said, it's an invoice. And he says, oh, you want me to pay for this? And I said, yeah, that's how I provide for my family. I would like to, like to get paid for it. So I got paid for it. It was no problem. So then I had a a call from uh, April Ferry. Uh, she said, I know that uh, Bruce Willis really liked your suit, your suits for that movie. Well, I'm working with him uh, for one up in Boston now. And I'd like, I'd like to come and collect some fabrics, go and see him, pick the fabrics out and have you make them. I said, sure. So about two days later, she says, I'm really sorry. And I said, well, what are you sorry about? She says, he said, he won't work with you. He said, you're too expensive because I've made him pay. And I said, look, that, that's fine. You can just carry on. So about 10 days later, she called up and she said, Leonard, would you mind making suits for him, but put, not putting your labels? We can't make him happy. He's just too fussy. <laughs> so I made him five suits and two sports jackets or three sports jackets for the movie. Never put, the, never put my label. He was like, a, he was like a, happy as a pig in <laughs> and, and, uh, and I got paid for it. So everybody was happy. Oh, so that's that, terrific. That, that was it. Well, maybe this is something for offline, but if you could uh, ever recall what suits and what movie that would be, I'd be very interested in seeing those. <laughs> well, Bruce Willis is, I, I mean, we watched Die Hard the other night. I mean, I'm a huge Bruce Willis fan. Um, my dad was a huge Bruce Willis fan. He's just a, he's just a natural on screen. And I think he can become, I think his persona off screen or his reputation off screen is something of a bit prickly nowadays. Um, I, I, work, I work with him after that on another movie and he couldn't have been nicer. I mean, right. we, he and I kind, kind of hit it off. I went, he lives or he had a house. He sold it now, a country house about 20 minutes from where I live. And I went out there with the costume designer, drove out there and we, we Amy Roth and we did some, uh, some fittings. And I think that was, that was motherless in Brooklyn. And um, I made him some, some clothes for that. But he, he couldn't have been nicer. 
I, I do. And whether he remembered or not, I don't know. <laughs> well, he's probably had a, a fair few tailors, like you say. They do. Um, okay. They do tend to gravitate to the freebies. I mean, so uh, that kind of segues into something I did have in the back of my mind that when you do costume for some of the actors on set and in real life, maybe it might be. Uh, De Niro, it might be DiCaprio. Do they kind of go, wow, this suit just looks immaculate. Can I, can you do me a couple of personal ones as well? And, and do, you, do they then become clients later down the road? Does it ever work like that? It's, 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 it, it's an interest that you say that because I always thought that I'd probably get some business out of it. But they do get so many freebies that when they come to see me, they pay. I made some clothes for John, for, John Fravaux Fabulous. After he liked what I made so much for Wolf of Wall Street, he ordered some suits. Uh, I did some for Sam Jackson and for for Tom Hanks, but only only a few, and then they disappear, and then you never see them again. Well, so, Sam Jackson was you know, uh, RoboCop, right? I mean, that kind of double RoboCop boy, yes. Yeah, yeah, loved him in that. <laughs> yeah, he, he was fun. In fact. I had to go up to Toronto to do fittings for him for that. That's where they were, were filming. And one thing I found is I'm working for the costume designer, but sometimes there's assistants around, the director, there's a producer or two, then there's the, cost, the, the actor and their personal assistants. Everybody wants to have an opinion. Right. I can't listen to everybody. So when I was fitting, fitting uh, uh, Sam Jackson on, there were about 10 or 12 people watching the fitting. And they're all saying, well, can you do this? Can you do that? So in the end, I turned my back on them. I turned him around a little bit. And then I just kind of whispered into his ear. And he and I worked out what we wanted to do with it. And then I took the jacket off without anybody looking. Because otherwise, I could never get it finished. You know, that's, that's just experience. That, that, you know, <laughs> I, I, know I love that. I love you have a shorthand with Sam Jackson. I think that's something that yeah. I'd just like to have on my tombstone. Um, <laughs> Leonard, we... we we started with a bit of Bond talk. I think maybe just end with a bit of Bond talk, if, if you don't mind. Are you a fan of the Bond films? Uh, do you have any aspirations of ever ever being involved with the Bond films or franchise at any point? Oh, it would be, it would be great. But, one, but the thing is, Tom Ford uh, pays to make the suits. So, and I, I'll tell you a story. I was making, I made two or three suits for Daniel Craig for a play. And the play wasn't running very long. And, the re and I said, why is it uh, such a short, uh, short run, Daniel? He says, well, I have to start prepping for, for Skyfall, the next, Bond, the next Bond movie. And I said, you're going to use Tom Ford? He goes, oh, yeah, well, you know, he's a good friend of mine. And, but Tom Ford pa pa pays them. But the thought of having a tailor make them, because to be quite honest, I think his suits look a a abysmal. But I was making clothes for the, for the menswear designer, a menswear buyer for Nima Marcus. Uh -huh. And he said they cannot keep the James Bond, Tom, Tom Ford suits in the, in the store. People are just lining up to buy them. So it, it, you know, it makes sense for a company like Tom Ford to, to put them out there. And I understand that. But, yeah. you know, there's, there's, it's not, there's, I can't make for everybody. You know, as long as I get some business on our other movies, then I'm, then I'm quite happy. But would I like to make one? Sure, it'd be a lot of fun. Oh, excellent! Well, I love that you've, uh, you've you've done something for Daniel Craig anyway. So that's, uh, that's yeah. really sweet. I'm thinking it must have been was it that play with Hugh Jackman? I'm trying to remember the name of it. Maybe. No, no, it was actually with Rachel Weiss was in it, oh, and okay. Ray, Rafe Spall. And I can't remember it. We, my wife and I went to see it and didn't enjoy it that much, if I'm really honest. <laughs> but it, it was fun. What I like to do. Uh, and it's so like I, I haven't seen all the movies I make clothes for, but when I can, I like to watch them because should I work with that actor again, I'd like to see how the, because when you fit, that's one thing, but when they're walking around and running and doing everything else, I like, I can see how the suit actually works on them. So when I work for them again, I, I, I've already got that in the back of my mind and do some alterations. I've just started a movie uh, with Stanley Tucci and I, I worked with him a while ago. And so I'm going to actually going to revisit the movie ah. the work with him was Julia and Julia, uh, so that I can I can take a look and it will help me when I make the new ones. Oh, terrific! Oh, but the uh, thing with Peter is never to be complacent. So I'm always looking to see if I can I can improve on what I did before. 
Well, so you get up at half five in the morning, so you get a march from quite a few people. <laughs> so that can't hurt at all. Um, and I look, I, I'm, I can't wait to see House of Gucci. I know that's going to be coming out soon. Um, I think from what I've seen in the trailers, the trailer, I, the trailer, the trailer looks trailer fantastic. It? I think it, really I'm cool. very excited. Of, um, I yeah. emailed Jantia and, and asked for an interview. I think she's just way too busy to get anywhere near her inbox at the minute, but um, I wish you both the success with that. I think it's going to be a huge smash and I can't wait to see it. Well, she started, she started a new movie already about Napoleon. Oh, <laughs> oh has she enlisted you for that? <laughs> No, no, that's that's all. That, that, that's what they'll use all the factory stuff uh, to make all the uniforms for that. All right. But uh, oh. again, that's France, and I'm out here, so it doesn't make a lot of sense, really. The only reason that she used me is because she trusted me from American Gangster. Adam Driver lives in Brooklyn, so we were close, and I'd already worked with uh, with Al Pacino, so it made it very easy. Uh, and De Niro uh, was going to be in it, and I was going to make for him, but then that fell through. Oh, oh well, look, it's still it's still a listed. It still looks looks fantastic, and the story yeah. itself, yeah. the story is just you know people can't believe that it hasn't been told before. I mean, it's such a well known. I know. I, know. I think they had to wait for, for for the real Mrs. Gucci to come out of prison before they did it. I don't know. I don't uh, know. Uh, do you have any uh, for something like this? Will you be invited to the press screening or a premiere? I, 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 I've never been invited to to any of the uh, the premieres. Um, Janty did mention that that that, that uh, she might try to get me a ticket, but now she's started on this this new movie. I won't I won't even bother her because so that, that it gets so well, when you when you take a look just at the trailer for the House of Gucci, my part was very small, uh, but compared to everything else, all the background, the fashion shows, the everything that she was doing. So now she's working on another huge movie with a lot of uniforms. The last thing she wants is me to phone her. Hey, Jane, think can I get a couple of tickets? <laughs> That'll oh, be fine. Well, listen, I can't wait to see it. Um, I hope you get a ticket somewhere for a screening. Uh, I, I'm amazed that the, the the people in the costume department aren't, you know, on the uh, red carpet for these events because, you know, they're front and centre a lot of the time. Their stuff's on show. So. Well, they are, but they actually don't get the credit. I mean, there, there was a, a movie out. It was The Trial of the Chicago Eight, and that was Susan Lyle. And I've worked with her several times. And when I watched the movie, and the, the way that she had got into the era for, for the costumes was unbelievable. Uh, it, it, was, it was up for an Oscar, but it wasn't seen as a big movie, and it, it never made it, obviously. But it, the, what, the work that she did on it was just phenomenal. But mm. it's, it's sort of subliminal to what else, the, the story and the, you know, the, the stars that are in it. Well, I don't know so much anymore. I think, you know, people are, especially with the advent of social media, you know, people just writing about it as people are glued to their screens now. They have been for the last two years. You know, they're not just watching movies anymore. They're kind of going, well, I may as well start a podcast. There's nothing else to do. I may as well talk about it. What can we talk? Let's talk about the style and, and how can they improve their own style? And they use films like that as templates. They use The Wolf of Wall Street. I mean, it might be, a, I guess, a period piece film, but they can still take... Uh, fashion cues and tips and you know and stuff like that to try and push their own wardrobe forward yeah so, that's true that's true leonard leonard thanks so much for your time and please thank barbara as well in the background there for helping us out with today I will. leonard logsdale.com the p place people can go i think you're up on 53rd street for the people native between madison and fifth yeah right and uh, and also follow the story on uh, instagram leonard logsdale and um, we'll put all the links on the show notes but Great speaking to you, Leonard. Thanks so much for your time. Okay, you're welcome. You take care, Peter. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.